All right, so let's dive into lecture 17, which is on special curves and uh, surfaces of revolution. Um, again, following Barrett O'Neill's uh, classic differential geometry text. Um, so there are three important special kinds of curves um, that we're going to study. Principal curves, asymptotic curves, and of course the famous geodesic. Now, or geodesic, I'll call it a geodesic, whatever. Anyway, um, a curve is principal. What that means is that the velocity um, to the curve is, is, is always pointing in a principal direction. Remember, principal directions are those directions which line up um, along the, the, um, the eigenvectors of the shape operator. All right, so the places, directions at a particular point in the surface where the, the normal curvature is, is extreme, um, minimized or maximized, all right? Um, asymptotic means that there's, it's, it's, it's the, the velocity is always pointing in a direction in which the normal curvature is zero. All right, that's the definition of an asymptotic direction is, is the direction in which the, the normal curvature is, is zero. Um, and then, I mean, uh, for example, every, um, <laughs> every direction is, is asymptotic in a plane. Um, and uh, if you have a surface, if you have a line in the surface, if there's a line contained in the surface, that would be an asymptotic, uh, an asymptotic curve because the the uh, velocity would be an asymptotic direction at each point along the curve. Geodesic um, means that in our current way of thinking the acceleration is always normal to m. Um, so here's some examples just to you know try to give you a, f a flavor for what we're talking about here. So that the torus, the top circle on the torus is um, an asymptotic curve because the, the um, Remember the Gaussian curvature is zero up here because one of the normal curvatures is zero. The other one's non-zero, of course. Um, and um, you have these circles uh, around the torus like that. Those are principal and ge geode geodesic. Um, here's, here's a model, three-dimensional model of a torus, a little foam thing you can get wherever. So I've tried to draw the, the top circle in red. And you can, you know, the, the curvature flattens out out there, right? Gaussian curvature is negative inside, and it's positive out here. But on the top, it's zero. That red curve would be an asymptotic curve because there's one direction. If you study the, uh, oh, let me find a shorter normal. Doo -doo -doo. So if you study the normal like this, you can see it's just parallel translating um, along that curve. In other words, the covariant derivative of the unit vector is is zero. Um, it's along this curve because the 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 the, uh, the normal is not changing its vector part. It's just changing its point of application. The unit normal is a parallel vector field along this asymptotic curve. Um, on the other hand, this guy's geodesic is easy enough to see. It's a circle, right? And uh, circles have acceleration <clears throat> that point toward. So it's, suppose it's a we can. Um, to make sure it's a, a geodesic, let's suppose it has units, uh, unit speed or, or at least constant, um, constant speed parameterization, and then the acceleration is purely center-seeking, centripetal if you like physics speak, so it's pointing in, right? And if the acceleration's pointing in, the, you know, uh, into the center of that blue circle, then of course it's, it's uh, in the same direction as the unit normal, which is in that same direction, right? So that's geodesic. And it's also principal because that's uh, one of the principal uh, directions. Um, okay, so silly examples aside, of course the plane has a lot to, a lot to offer too. Um, in the plane the, um, the curves that have acceleration which are zero, well zero of course is normal to m because zero is perpendicular to everything so if you have acceleration, if you can find a solution to uh, finding a solution, uh, find a curve, rather in your in your surface which has zero acceleration, um, then that uh, that curve will automatically be a, uh, a geodesic. In other words, if your surface has a line in it, that line is going to be ge geodesic, um, because lines have well, assuming that the line is not got some kind of crazy. Um, 
I mean, this is sensitive. This comment about geodesics is sensitive to parameterization, right? So if I give the, if I take a line and I give it some kind of speed up, slow down parameterization, then that could get me into trouble. But I'm assuming that the line has a, has parameterization, which is constant speed. All right. Then um, the, these this other wacky curve here in the plane, it's it's principal and asymptotic, but it's not geodesic. It's asymptotic's unavoidable. <laughs> the only normal curvatures to find um, are, are zero in the plane. And it's, it's principal because every direction is um, a direction in which we have zero normal curvature. So it's kind of a stupid case. But anyway, it's a case nonetheless. Uh, moving along, we have lemma 6.2, um, which I will cover up the proof of as not to distract us. All right. Let alpha be regular curve and u the unit normal and a surface m. Restricted. Um, um, so we're, we're restricting the unit normal to alpha. All right. Then we have the following one: if if alpha is a principal curve, then um, the derivative of the unit normal along alpha and uh, alpha prime are collinear at each point. That's if and only if. And also, if if alpha is principal, that implies the principal curvature in the alpha direct alpha in the, in the tangent direction to the curve um, is given by the acceleration dot the unit normal divided by the, the speed squared. All right. So how do you how do you prove such a thing? Well, suppose that alpha is principal. That means that the shape operator on the velocity is equal to the uh, k times alpha prime, where k is the principal curvature by definition of principal curvature. Uh, this is you know, definition well, definition of uh, normal <sighs> curvature and um, also the um, definition of principal direction. Anyway, let me shut up. So the shape operator acting on alpha prime is minus the covariant derivative. Um, in the alpha prime direction of the unit normal, but that, remember, can be calculated as the derivative of the unit normal along the vector field alpha. That was one of our um, characterizations of the covariant derivative, but there you have it. Um, this is equal to k alpha prime, but u prime, it's also equal to minus u prime, which shows you that u prime and alpha prime are collinear. Um, conversely, if we have that u prime and alpha prime are collinear, that implies that u prime is equal to minus k alpha prime, which implies that the shape operator acting on alpha prime is k alpha prime, which of course implies that alpha is principal curve because that happens at each point. All right. Proof of two. Well, if you have a principal curve, that implies that s of alpha prime is equal to k alpha prime by what we just did. And however, we also know that alpha prime I mean, the velocity dot the shape operator in the velocity direction is equal to the acceleration dot the unit normal. That's back from section 5.2 of previous lecture. Um, therefore, we get alpha prime, uh, let's see here, where was I? I was a plug, let me use some color. So we're taking, we're going, okay, so we got this, right? And we're just replacing this to get that okay so you get alpha prime dot alpha prime and then solve for k done all right uh, so the, the the proofs in this section are you know they're, they're, they're not too hard to work out uh, and I'm just I'll talk through them as we go here but what we're more interested in of course is the geometric content which I will try to expose um, let alpha be a curve formed by the intersection of a surface M and a plane P all right so like here is I'm trying to envision a, a cylinder, right? And there's like two 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 uh, two planes I'm thinking about. Here's a plane P, all right. And this orange plane actually will not fit the criteria of the lemma because the um, the unit normal to the cylinder is at a different angle to the plane at different points on the curve of intersection. See, like here the angle is more than 90 degrees. Here it's less than 90 degrees if you can picture it. Whereas this this red plane down here. Um, you can see that it slices a cross section, so the unit normal actually just straight up lies in the plane. Um, so it's making a 90 degree angle with the normal to the plane at each point along the, along the curve of intersection. So that's the kind of plane we want for this lemma. So if the angle between M and P is constant along alpha, then alpha is a principal curve of M. So the proof is very, very natural. You take a unit normal to the surface, you take a, a unit normal to the, to the plane, um, all right, then 
you agree that the angle is constant, that's given, right? So theta dot, let's say, is that constant. Then, so that means that the dot product, u dot v, is equal to cosine theta naught because the usual formula for dot product has also, of course, the length of u times the length of v, but those are both 1, so they vanish, and we just have cosine theta naught. The point is that's constant, so we have that the derivative of u dot v is equal to 0, all right? But on the flip side, of course, we have the product rule, and the product rule gives us that. Now, to be clear, though, this is not just for all points in the plane. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't even make sense in some sense, in some regard to take this dot product where we have points which are at um, different points in three-dimensional space, right? So we're taking this dot product at the points of application for the vector field u and the vector field v, which are in common. In other words, the curve of intersection, the curve of intersection is those points which are shared in common to the unit normal of p and the unit normal of the surface. Um, and so along those points, I can evaluate the dot product um, along that curve alpha. And so in that context is when we have the, the, the dot product is zero. And in that context, I take the product rule. And, and so for there, you, you get uh, u prime alpha dot v plus u dot v alpha prime. But you know v is the unit normal to a plane, which is a constant in its application, right? Even the point's changing. But the vector part of that v is, is zero. I mean, it's not zero. It's, it's, it's constant. It's a plane, right? It's a plane normal. So that just then gives us that u prime uh, alpha dot v is equal to zero. But we also know that u prime alpha dot u is equal to zero. So we've got that u prime alpha is, is perpendicular to, to both u and to v. Um, and uh, of course, likewise, we also know that the velocity of the curve is perpendicular to both u and v, right? Um, because alpha lies both in the surface and the, and the, and the plane and it's tangent, right? So if, if u and v are linearly independent, then it follows that alpha prime is collinear to u prime, and ah, hence by lemma 6.2, alpha prime is principal. Now, let's just go through the details of that a little bit. Um, so if, if u and v are linearly independent, that means that u cross v is not equal to zero, right? And so, u prime being perpendicular to u and v, what's that mean? We only have three dimensions to work with, right? So if u prime is perpendicular to u and v, that must mean that it's in the same direction as u cross v, right? It's collinear to u cross v. Likewise, since alpha prime is perpendicular to u and v, since, it's, since the curve is tangent um, to both surfaces, right? It's tangent to both normals to both surfaces. That means then, of course, that the velocity is also collinear to u cross v, but you know, we only have three dimensions to work with, so it's then going to imply then that um, u prime is collinear to alpha prime, all right? On the other hand, um, if u and v are not linearly independent, then since they both have length 1, um, then they both, they has to be plus or minus, u has to be plus or minus v, right? But then since v is constant, that means that u would also be constant. So then since if u is constant along the curve, that means the shape operator is 0. Um, along the curve, in, in the direction of the velocity of the curve, at least. And that would then, again, say that alpha prime is principal with k of alpha prime equal to zero. It's kind of a silly case. All right, fine. You, you, to, to, to calculate normal curvature, I should put a unit vector in, so like that if you want. All right. So this gives us a, a method to calculate, uh, to, to find principal curves, if you can find, um, you know, sh uh, planes which intersect a surface, right? Uh, like you can imagine planes going through the center of the sphere, if you can envision it. Those planes will um, make a constant angle, right, with the, uh, the unit normal to the sphere, if you can envision that. And likewise, for something like the torus, uh, let's see, if you can, you can chop it, like, like, you know, you can make a chop which has intersection, the blue, the little blue fuzzy there. That, that would be a plane which takes the blue line as the intersection of the plane and the torus. Um, that would fit this lemma as well and show you that that curve is principal. So there's a lot you can do with this lemma in terms of if you can envision planes slicing surfaces, you can see a lot. Um, it's also, all right, but again, you have to have the plane has to be the special kind which makes that constant angle between the normal to the surface and the normal to the plane, right? But um, another just big class of example 
application to this is the meridians and parallels of a surface of revolution give principal curves because, and here's my feeble attempt at a picture, um, so my, my attempt at a picture of that. So here's like a surface of revolution. Of course, if you take the, the um, cross section where the axis is normal to the plane, right, like this, then the curve of intersection is a parallel to the surface of revolution, right? The circle is parallel, and, and that is going to be a, uh, a principal curve <clears throat> by this lemma, lemma 6.3. And, um, sorry, keep my stuff in order here. Um, harder for me to illustrate, but um, also if you can imagine taking a plane which has, uh, contains the axis, right, and then it, it, uh, it goes out from the axis, right, uh, like that. So here's a picture. I'm imagining that that's the intersection of this plane that's that is and contains the axis and then and goes out. Like here's a, here's a an end view of it. From there's the point of the axis of rotation for the surface. And this I'm trying to illustrate. This this piece right here is this this curve viewed on from like viewing it from over here, say. And um, that plane would um, you, I'm, the plane would be like a you know plane that goes through the axis um, like that. And um, you can see then that the plane makes a constant angle. I mean, so the angle, the plane is actually always at 90 degrees um, from the, um, the, the normal to the plane, of course, I'm talking about. The normal to the plane is always perpendicular to the unit normal to the uh, surface of revolution. And so this lemma applies. And there you have it. Meridians and parallels are principal curves. Um, well, anyway, I tried to picture it. Moving along, asymptotic curves. So an asymptotic curve, uh, there's a lemma which pretty much tells you how to work with it. Uh, this lemma is pretty over, overreaching. Well, not overreaching, it's, it's, uh, it just it, it gets what it should. And it's not that hard to prove either. Um, but let me just state the lemma first. Um, so if we have a point P and a surface, of course the Gaussian curvature, remember, is the determinant of the shape operator at the point. Um, anyway, so if the Gaussian curvature is positive, then there are no asymptotic directions. Like, for example, on this sphere, there are no asymptotic directions, all right? Um, there's no direction in which the normal curvature is zero, all right? Uh, on the other hand, if you have a Gaussian curvature less than zero, there are exactly two asymptotic directions. So, for example, this thing um, inside, right, like in here, any point in here, there are going to be two uh, asymptotic directions um, because this normal, the normal curvature, like in this direction, and the normal curvature in that direction. So this normal curvature, I think, is negative. Is that right? I can't remember. Well, one of them is negative and one of them is positive. Um, so between this one and the... Uh, do 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 second here. Hard to see the contrast of white on white. Maybe if I'll, I'll use brown. I'll actually use brown. So, of course, the other uh, uh, principle... So let's, let's look at this. Well, oh, fooey. I can't draw anything. So here, um, you can imagine the point of intersection there, right? So like here, those are the two, the two principal curves at that point, right? And um, so one of these is positive, one of these is negative. So in between, there has to be a place where the normal curvature is zero, like this direction and also that direction, something like that. It's, well, I will not try to draw those, but anyway, that's case two. The Gaussian curvature negative. There are two asymptotic directions. And you know what? We can even kind of picture it. The uh, principal curvatures are like this and that. Principal curvature E1 is at theta equal to zero by construction of theta, basically. E2 is 90 degrees that way. Um, then the asymptotic directions fit like, like this and that. Um, and the angle between E1 and A2 
we can take to be theta, where tangent squared theta is given by that ratio. Finally, if the Gaussian curvature is zero, all directions are asymptotic at P. If it's a planar point, um, like in a plane, <laughs> every point's a planar point. Um, otherwise, there's exactly one asymptotic direction, which is also principal, which was the um, top of the torus was those kinds of points where Gaussian curvature is zero, but this is the asymptotic direction, and that's the only asymptotic direction along the, the red line, right, like that. Um, fixing the point of intersection between the blue fuzzy and the red line is what I was talking about. So the proof is all by this lovely Euler's formula that we talked about before, k1 p cosine squared theta plus k2 p sine squared theta, where k1 and k2 are the principal curvatures at the point. So like 1, if Gaussian curvature is positive, that means that k1 and k2 are, k1 are, are either both positive or both negative, but that means that this quantity is either strictly positive or strictly negative, because when you take positive numbers, like sine squared and cosine squared, or rather non-negative numbers, and they both can't be zero at the same time, right? Cosine and sine are never simultaneously zero. So that means that this quantity stays positive or stays negative. And so if it stays positive or stays negative, it certainly can't be zero, all right? Case two, if the Gaussian curvature is less than zero, that means that you can solve this, basically. Zero equals to that plus that. So I just solve, you get tangent squared theta is minus k1 over k2. So theta is plus or minus the inverse tangent of minus k1 over k2, where I use the usual inverse tangent, which takes domain between plus or minus uh, pi over 2 or 90 degrees, if you prefer. And so that fits with this picture up here. You get two solutions between, I mean, whichever one you call a1, whichever one you call a2, one of these will be positive, right? And so if the plus is the positive one, then if the plus goes with the positive solution, then that puts that makes the plus solution be the a2, and then the, the other solution's minus, which flips it over here like that, um, and so the, the picture is accurate. And finally, if it's planar, that means k1 and k2 are both zero, so the normal curvature is zero in all directions, right? All directions are asymptotic. Otherwise, you could just suppose that the, uh, let's just say that the second normal curvature is zero, that would mean that by Euler's formula we have k of u is k1 of p cosine squared theta, which means that the only way we get zero is when cosine squared is zero, but that only happens in the uh, theta equals pi over two, um, e2 direction. So there's just one asymptotic direction as, as claimed. Sorry if you can hear my, the washing machine upstairs, it gets kind of noisy. I thought it had stopped, but apparently it was just resting. If you can't hear it, I'm sorry I'm talking about noises that apparently I can only hear. All right, I'm not crazy though. Really not, all right. Maybe I'm crazy, I don't know. Okay, uh, the danger of talking to yourself. All right, so, um, hmm. Although, well, it is true I'm talking to myself. I hope people are listening. Hmm, interesting. Uh, the YouTube. So, page six here um, of what lecture am I on? Uh, I will get back on track here eventually. Uh, lecture 17. All right. Ah! Stop that, you silly paper. Haha, <laughs> magnets. So, examples. The sphere has no asymptotic directions because, well, and he, he introduces another way, O'Neill introduces another way of seeing this um, sort of intuitively. You can think about whether or not the tangent plane intersects the surface again. If the tangent plane intersects the surface, then those curves formed by the intersection turn out to be the uh, asymptotic curves um, at the point in question. So like no asymptotic direction saddle surface, uh, hard for me to envision, but if you look at the tangent plane through the origin, it will intersect. I mean, I, I can verify it algebraically without too much trouble. Of course, the uh, x and y coordinate axes are in that plane. That's easy to see because if you put x equal to zero, it works. But y equal to zero it works, right? And of course, lines are asymptotic because the, um, well, anyway, but those are the asymptotic directions um, at P. Um, <clears throat> well, anyway, there. Uh, and then the torus, there's so much to see in the torus. The torus example is so great. So much to see from the torus. Uh, you've got lots of cases. So on the other, on the one hand, if you're out here on the torus, right, uh, forget about my toy. Out here, the torus, uh, 
you have no intersection, right? And that corresponds to the fact that it's got positive Gaussian curvature, so there's no asymptotic direction. At the top of the torus, you've just got that, that top curve. And uh, so you have one asymptotic direction where the Gaussian curvature is zero. And then inside, um, although it's really hard for me to picture this, even looking at my toy, I, I really have trouble seeing it. There's two curves which intersect that um, plane because the plane would kind of like, it would, it would be inside the surface, right? And then it would, eh, because the, the, the torus curves up off that point. So if you look at the tangent plane, it would actually be behind the uh, inner skin of the torus, but um, it would intersect, of course, the torus a couple points because it uh, those, those, those curves of intersection would would be in the direction of the um, the um, asymptotic directions of which there are two there. All right. Anyway, setting aside things I cannot direct. Oh man, I keep hitting my head on this this board here. I keep hitting my head on. All right. So. That, of course, I, I should define it carefully. Um, a regular curve, which is always pointing in an asymptotic direction, is called an asymptotic curve, right? That just means that the normal curvature and the velocity along the direction of the velocity is zero along the whole curve. So there's some simple things you can calculate, like the shape operator and direction of velocity dot velocity is acceleration dot the unit normal, all right? But on the other hand, we have the definition of normal curvature is that k of the velocity is, is s of alpha prime dot alpha prime. Now that assumes, I think, that the um, alpha is unit speed, all right? But because um, I'm, I'm supposed to calculate normal curvatures for, um, you know, for unit vectors. But uh, anyway, so if, if, alpha is alpha, if alpha is asymptotic, right, then uh, k of alpha prime is zero which then means that s of alpha prime dot alpha prime is equal to zero. So that means that the acceleration of the asymptotic curve is perpendicular to the unit normal, right? So, or another way to say it is that the acceleration has to be tangent to m. If it's perpendicular to the normal, by process of elimination, that means it falls in the tangent plane. And um, also, let's see here. S of alpha prime is minus the uh, you the derivative of the unit normal along the curve alpha, right? So we also have that the um, derivative of the unit normal dot the velocity is equal to zero along the curve. Um, now he points out at this at this point that uh, the helicoid example, and which was in our, my lecture fifth sixteen, um, we had L and N both being zero. Those are the accelerations along the coordinate curves, right? So if the accelerations along the coordinate curves are zero, um, well, excuse me, it's the dot product of the acceleration with u. That was the l and the n, right? So those being zero means that the, um, the coordinate curves were asymptotic for the helicoid uh, example, if I, if I read this correctly. All right. Um, I mean, I guess I can get that back out. Where's my lecture 16? Uh, Where's that silly example? <sighs> do, 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 do. Where's that silly helicoid? There's a saddle. <sighs> Cylinder. Just the helicoid. Ah, here it is. Yeah, this one. So, remember, this was the helicoid. And we calculated that uh, L was zero and N was zero, where, where L and N were unit normal dot uh, this guy and unit normal dot that guy. So, hmm. All right. Let me get this out of the way. Yeah back to your home. There we go. Proposition M is minimal if there exist two orthogonal asymptotic directions at each point. Now when are there two orthogonal asymptotic directions? It's either when, um, let's see here, either when the curvature is negative or when the, when the Gaussian curvature is zero, of course. 
Um, well, let's get into it. So if m is minimal, then the sum of the eigenvalues of the shape operator uh, have to be zero. I mean, well, there's a, there's a factor of two involved, but you know, principal curvatures have to sum to zero, which means that k1 is equal to minus k2. Um, thus, if you look at Euler's formula, you get k of u is this. And so theta equals to plus or minus pi over four gives you zero in this, right? So the asymptotic uh, vectors are um, a1 and a2, and there's pi over 2 between them, right, which means that they're orthogonal. Conversely, if you have two asymptotic directions with that, that product being 0, then, of course, by definition, the normal curvatures are 0. And if I take a1 to be at theta1 and a2 to be at theta2, we know that um, theta2 is like pi over 2 plus theta1 because they're orthogonal. And so that gives me these two lovely systems of equations, but um, sorry, let me shift it up here a bit. So, um, but of course, by you know adding angles formulas for sine and cosine, I can change this to a minus sine theta one and to a cosine theta one because theta one and theta two are related by the shift. And so, when you look at these two equations, then that implies that k one is equal to minus k two which then shows you that the mean curvature is zero and hence the surface is minimal. I think I have some more details about that on the next... Oh, no I don't. Oh, hmm, thought I had more. But, uh, right, let me see here. If you have this equation and that equation, um, let's see here. I think you just do, some, do, just do a little algebra and you get to k1 is equal to minus k2 from this and that. Um, I saw it when I wrote these, and now it's, yeah, well, if I thought about it, I mean, let me just let it, leave it to you, you guys, nothing big there. A ruled surface is swept out by a line moving in R3. So examples of a ruled surface is a helicoid and a saddle surface. It'd be, it'd be cool to have an animation of that, I think, by the way. Um, I don't at the moment, but um, here's a lemma for you. A ruled surface M has a Gaussian curvature K less than or equal to zero. Furthermore, if k is equal to zero, k is equal to zero if and only if the unit normal is parallel parallel along each ruling of m. Um, so, <laughs> think a plane is a stupid example of a ruled surface, um, but uh, a helicoid and saddle surface are pretty interesting examples of them, right? So here's the proof: ruled surfaces contain lines, right? Lines have acceleration zero. But acceleration zero implies that alpha is asymptotic, which means that k is the Gaussian curvature is less than or equal to zero by lemma 6.4. Um, and I said see page five, so let me just do that for just a second here. Oh man, I have more trouble with these papers today. Stay in place. All right, so. Um, page five. All right, so page five. So if k is, if the Gaussian curvature is, what we, we just said, the Gaussian curvature is less than or equal to zero, which means we're either in case two or in case three, right? In either case, there is um, an asymptotic direction, right? So, um, hmm. Let me move along here. Um, oh, I, I think the point is, if we have an asymptotic direction, that means that we can't be the we can't be in the case where the Gaussian curvature is positive, of course, right? Because if if it was if there is an, if there exists an asymptotic direction, then we're not in case one. That was the point. All right, all right. So suppose um, you have a line which is ruling an M, which is parallel along the curve alpha. Then, of course, the shape operator. And the direction of velocity of the curve is, is that, minus the derivative of the unit normal along the curve, uh, minus, right? Um, but that says that the normal curvature in the alpha prime direction is equal to zero. Consequently, um, alpha is principal, and um, the Gaussian curvature is zero. All right, so we, we assumed that we had a unit normal parallel along each ruling, 
and we showed the k equals zero. So we, we showed this direction of the implication. Conversely, if we assume that the Gaussian curvature is zero, then by lemma 6.4 case 3, we know that there is a, at least, uh, I mean, there's, there is, well, there are um, asymptotic directions. Um, see, s of alpha prime equal minus u prime equal zero. Um, so u is parallel along, parallel to the ruling alpha. Um, oh, yeah, like I said, look at page 245 um, for a less stumbly comment um, presentation of that. Silly application. Spheres and torus, or tori, I suppose, are not ruled, right? Why is that? Well, if they were ruled, then um, that would be really troubling because, as you know, the sphere and the torus both have points in which the curvature, the Gaussian curvature is positive, right? So a ruled surface has Gaussian curvature non-positive, right? It could be zero or it could be negative, but certainly not positive. So if you have a surface and it has positive Gaussian curvature, it can't possibly be a ruled surface. Which is kind of cool because as you can see, things that are ruled surfaces, at least in my humble opinion, are not immediately obviously ruled, like helicoids and saddles. I don't look at those and go, oh, well, obviously ruled, right? So, I mean, this is kind of a nice little comment here. Finally, we reach the point of talking about geodesics. Sorry, was I saying geodesic? I can't remember. Oh well. I make everyone annoyed with my pronunciation. Anyway, so uh, curve alpha is geodesic of um, if its acceleration is always normal to m. That's the definition for us here. So some comments. The comment number one: the inhabitants of m feel. <laughs> Or that means uh, no acceleration along the geodesic alpha because the acceleration is off world now just a little bit more on this comment well physics right Newtonian mechanics in particular relates forces to acceleration right so if the acceleration isn't even expressible in terms of the geometry uh, of the surface which is the tangent direction right the normal direction is off the surface so if you were stuck in the surface you couldn't couldn't really understand um, what what that meant unless you could actually see off the surface, in which case you wouldn't really be living on the surface um, in the same sense we don't really live on Earth. Hmm. Well, anyway, take this comment for what it means. Number two. I think we live on Earth. All right. Uh, later, we'll learn geodesics, like lines and plane, give length-minimizing paths in the surface. And uh, one other distinguishing thing between geodesics and asymptotic curves, or principal curves, asymptotic curves or principal curves, usually you, you only have a couple of them. Like, there's no guarantee you have an asymptotic in every direction or, or a principal curve in every direction at a given point. In fact, if it is the case that every direction is principal um, or every direction is asymptotic, that's, that's actually pretty special, right? Um, so... For example, I mean, it has a name. It's an umbilic point if the normal curvature is constant, right? So it's not usually the case. And the contrast, geodesics, there is usually, maybe always, uh, I think it depends on some careful statements of things, but uh, there's usually lots and lots of geodesics going through a given point, right? Certainly for a surface, like we're talking about, if you take a point and you have a velocity, you know, velocity vector in any direction, there is a geodesic which takes that velocity as its, that, that vector as its tangent, as its initial velocity, so. All right. Three, the, uh, if the acceleration is perpendicular to the tangent space to P at M, that means that alpha prime prime dot alpha prime is equal to zero, but if you remember the derivation of the conservation of energy in, in mechanics, this should be familiar to you. This basically is acceleration dot velocity, right, which is the derivative of velocity squared this is essentially kinetic energy. Um, but anyway, the point is, if you have this condition, that means that the speed is constant. And so geodesics have constant speed. All right. Four, constant curves are trivially geodesic, but we don't talk about those too much, except that we talked about them. All right, sorry. We did talk about them. That's it, though. Uh, lines have acceleration zero, hence a line in M will be geodesic. All right, so those are some useful simple comments. Here's some simple examples. 
trying to keep it simple. <laughs> Although simple is not an entirely simple term in math if you just keep going. By the way, simple has a technical meaning. <laughs> um, <laughs> planes, uh, if alpha is a geodesic to a plane and the plane has normal u, that means that, um, well, first of all, alpha prime dot u is equal to zero, right? Because it's, it's, the velocity has to be tangent to the normal. And um, differentiating that, that gives me acceleration dot the uh, unit normal is equal to zero. But because it's geodesic, the acceleration is collinear with u, right? So how can you be collinear with u and have, and be perpendicular to u? The only way you can do that is if you're zero. And if the acceleration is zero, we can integrate twice and we get a line. So the only geodesics in the plane are lines, all right? Now, in the sphere, the geodesic is, is formed by great circles. A great circle is formed by the intersection of a plane through the origin and the sphere, all right? Now, of course, these are also principal curves in the sphere using that other lemma, right? Here's a feeble attempt at a picture of it. So your sphere, you chop it. So like this uh, plastic weld or whatever it is is an example of a great circle. There it is. The plane we're talking about contains diameters and the center of the sphere. Inside the sphere and then of course there, well it's a plane so it goes on and on. Alright, um, cylinders. For x squared plus y squared equals r squared, geodesics have, have the form blah. Now that um, is, and here's the proof that it's geodesic, so I differentiate twice, I get this lovely thing, but this is exactly minus a squared r times the unit normal to the cylinder, which shows you that the acceleration is collinear with the, um, the unit normal, hence alpha is geodesic as claimed. And this particular um, example cylinder, I'm really fond of this example of geodesics on the cylinder because there's there's just a, there's a lot to say about it. It's a really beautiful example when you study the calculus of, of variations, as we will do for a couple days, at least in my advanced calculus course. So I have more to say about there, but um, so there's special cases, right? If you take a equals to zero, you get this is like a fixed point, right? And then this just varies. So um, you get a line, a so-called ruling of the cylinder. Um, on the other hand, if c is equal to zero and a is not, then you get a circle like the circle around the cylinder, right? So the the ruling would be something like this, right? The, the circle would be something like, so c equal to zero would be something like this, right? And then when, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then when they're both non-zero, you get some kind of, although I probably can't draw this. Well, I don't know. I'm not so sure about my, 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 my helix, but on the flip side, I could show you. So like, here's a line. I'm going to try to draw a line. Bear with me, folks. All right, there's a line. And then if you take this and yeah, make it into a cylinder, I tried, um, close to a cylinder anyway, that line is a geodesic on the cylinder. So the lines that you draw on a, on a piece of paper before you roll it into a cylinder, those become the geodesics for this flat cylinder. Anyway, um, the derivation of it is actually kind of fun, so let's look at it for a minute. Um, so if you take any curve, so any curve in the cylinder you can reasonably write in terms of two unknown functions, theta and h, all right? Twice differentiate that thing, out pops this, this, and this. Of course, h prime prime. Now this has to be collinear with the unit normal, but the unit normal has no z component, which means that h prime prime has to be zero. Integrate twice, you get cd ct plus d, that's half of what we want, right? But um, then again, differentiating uh, once, I get the velocity, right? And um, that has to be what? 
well, it has to be constant if this is going to be a geodesic by our previous argument, so alpha prime prime, alpha, the length of the velocity um, squared has to be constant, but that gives you r squared sine squared plus cosine squared theta prime squared plus c squared equals to constant. But if I can, I can absorb the c squared in the constant, then I can absorb the r squared in the constant, and I can take the square root, so I get theta prime is constant, integrate, and voila. Theta is at plus b, and there you have it. That's that formula that I just dropped from the sky in the last page. Don't look at this. <laughs> uh, anyway, yes, all right. There's, of course, lots more to say about how you can construct uh, pictures from rolling up little pieces of paper and gluing them together and things. Like, there's, there's a lot to say about all that, but anyway. Probably not <clears throat> in this course. Proposition. If alpha is a unit speed curve in M and it lies along a plane P, which is everywhere orthogonal to M, um, along alpha, then alpha is a geodesic to M. Proof. Well, so alpha prime, the alpha prime is 1 because it's unit speed. So that means that the velocity is perpendicular to acceleration, right? However, both the acceleration and the velocity lie in the plane and the velocity is tangent to the surface as well, right? So that means that the acceleration must be orthogonal to m. And so if the acceleration is orthogonal to m, that's another way of saying that the acceleration is collinear to the unit normal to m, which is to say that alpha is geodesic. Application. The meridians are geodesics to the surface of revolution, like if you can imagine this plane um, through that you know goes to the axis of the surface of revolution, it cuts the surface of revolution in this little orange curve here, and you can I'm trying to picture it the uh, unit normals are what um, they are everywhere orthogonal to m. Um, well, of course the unit normals to m are everywhere orthogonal to m, but what else? The curve alpha lies in a plane P, yeah, lies in a plane P, which is everywhere orthogonal to M. So the, 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 the catch is that this gray plane is also everywhere um, orthogonal to the surface in its, in its intersection, right? Because the, the plane normal, if you let me draw it in red here, you could take to be like this, right? Well, my picture isn't worth anything, but there's there's right angle between the unit normal to the surface and the, the plane normal. Well, if you, you can see it from my picture, you're doing better than I am. <laughs> All right, so that brings us to surfaces of revolution, um, which interestingly enough have very little to do with politics. But um, let's see here. Study a patch. This is the standard revolution patch, and so basically you can calculate the E, the F, the G. You get these lovely formulas, right? And likewise, you can calculate the, the normal vector field, the unit normal. Some nice algebra happens. You can calculate the accelerations of the coordinate curves, the mixed acceleration, or whatever you want to call that thing. Um, and out pop the L, the M, the N, these lovely formulas. But this is really cool because you have F equals to zero, which makes it an orthogonal patch, and you have m equals to zero, zero. So you have f and m being zero. That makes this thing a principal patch, which you may recall from the previous lecture on special awesome formulas for calculating things. We worked out this exercise, you may recall, you may recall, this one, that showed that um, <clears throat> If a patch was orthogonal, then you had these lovely formulas. If it was in addition principal, you had these amazing formulas that the shape operator was just L over E for XU, and it multiplies by N over G for XV, which means that the, uh, the, um, the partial velocities, in fact, were principal, um, with these being the principal curvatures, and it's just, just pretty awesome. Really nice case, really nice case, right? Um, so, a kind professor would give those sorts of examples on, on tests. <laughs> Who knows what I'll do. Um, okay, so X being a principal patch, <coughs> excuse me, 
as I was just recapping, we have these lovely formulas. Now he, he uses k mu and k pi for reasons that are probably historical, I don't know. And um, when you calculate that for the L and the E, F, T, L, M, N, P, Q, R, S, T, whatever. Okay, um, out pop these lovely formulas. It's pretty neat though because we're calculating the principal curvatures for essentially arbitrary surfaces of revolution, which is, is kind of cool. There's the lovely formulas. Now that gives us this formula for the Gaussian curvature, which is interesting because of course the G and the H were just functions of U, and this shows you explicitly that the Gaussian curvature is a function of U alone, which means that Gaussian curvature is constant as V varies. In other words, as you sweep through the parallels of the surface of revolution, the Gaussian curvature is constant along those, which makes good geometric sense. Now, some, some surfaces of revolution can be recapped just using um, the G function as just being simply U. If you do that, these formulas simplify down to this, right? And so that's, that's pretty, pretty nice. Now, I've got one example written out it's really worth your time to read the rest of the section in O'Neill uh, here. You, it's a very, very, very beautiful example, the bugle surface and the catenoid past what I have to talk about here. And he also shows you how you can reverse engineer things like given a, um, you know, given a Gaussian curvature, you can find a surface which takes it as its Gaussian curvature. I'll try to read that for you in a second here. Anyway, for the torus, it basically has G and H as its, as its functions which define the surface revolution. And from those we can calculate the E, the F, the G, the L, the M, the N. And we get these lovely formulas. And so that gives us the one principal curvature is 1 over R. The other principal curvature is cosine U over R plus R cosine U. Hence the Gaussian curvature is cosine U over R times parentheses R plus R cosine U. That's a very nice formula because you can see from the torus all the different things we've been talking about. For one thing, on the outer outer equator, that would be where u is equal to zero if you study the formulas. We have Gaussian curvature one over r times r plus r, which is where the Gaussian curvature would be largest on the on the uh, you know on this torus. On the flip side, the inner equator would be where u is equal to pi. All right. And there you have Gaussian curvature negative, as we talked about. It's it's saddle shaped in here. It's right like a paraboloid outside locally. And then the top circle is where you have cosine is zero, right? So top surface, top circle is where the Gaussian curvature is zero, just like we've talked about, all right? And also the bottom circle with theta u equal to minus pi over two. And so those they're really uh, really nice. Um, Really nice example. Really nice calculation. Now, like I said, uh, he also uh, he 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 uh, studies the catenoid. Let me just jot down. Oh, sorry, just getting a piece of paper. So let me see here, just to complete the thought of this lecture. What page am I on? Sixteen. All right, so sixteen. Uh, O'Neill also calculates for the catenoid catenoid that has uh, basically well he doesn't even tell me what G and U are he says what's he tell us here well it's, anyway it's Y is equal to C oops C Kosh of x over c, it's a catenary, revolved around, um, you know, the uh, x-axis, right? This is the shape like a hanging, hanging chain makes, and so he, he, through the formulas of this lovely section, h, it's, it's minimal, and the Gaussian curvature works out to minus 1 over, we do reference this formula later, which is why I'm writing it down, c squared, the fourth power of the hyperbolic cosine x over c, man, that's a cool formula. All right, and then finally, theorem, which is worth writing down, probably makes a nice test question. Uh, if a surface of revolution M is a minimal surface,
um, then M is contained either in a plane or a catenoid. <laughs> cool. The proof um, is just a it's not not too long. It's a neat little argument. You can look at page 255 of O'Neill's second revised edition. Now, like I said, he has some special comments about, uh, you know, further simplifications of surfaces of revolution if you use the so-called canonical parameterization, um, which means I think that the profile curve is, um, you know, of a unit speed parameterization. And so there's some very, very nice, about two, two, three pages I'm skipping over here, including the bugle surface, which we do refer, refer to later. But uh, anyway, I'll let you read that, and I will cut it off right there. So next up is Chapter 6, which is very exciting. We'll get back to our differential forms, and we'll learn how to redo all of these things using the beautiful exterior calculus of Carton. Thanks.